your weary brow Light shining in the pouring rain See somehow caught comfort in the broken tree I won't let it bring me to my knees I'm not drowning I'm not drowning now There have been probably several phases to my career, or let's say my time playing music, and there have been quite a few specific phases. Whether there, there was exactly nine, I don't know, it depends how you choose to divide them up, but that wasn't really the, the initial idea. The album's called Nine Lives, and there are nine songs on it. And I don't think it was really by accident, because each song uh, has a life of its own. And perhaps it's the opposite of a concept album, which is a concept in itself, to try and make, uh, or, or let's say, a book of short stories, rather than a novel. different sort of album for me. It's very much a band album. A lot of the songs actually came out of jamming or warming up or tuning up. The ideas were born out of what the musicians played because the band that, that recorded it are the, the, my regular band that tours with me. Jose Netta plays guitar. Richard Bailey drums. Carl van der Bosch on percussion and Paul Booth plays sax, flute and some keyboard. We played them all together, recorded them all together. There were things that were inspired out of jams that we had all played together. So I like to think that the album is based on that idea rather than conceptualized and getting musicians to play things that someone else has thought of. Rather, we try to utilize what the musician's natural playing ability is. <laughs> All right. Traffic used to work in a very similar way in as much as Jim Capaldi and I and Chris Wood, we never set out to be songwriters. We were musicians foremost and in order to sit down and play and improvise we had to have uh, songs in order to comply with our whatever it was record deal or to just comply with you know what things were at the time. So we started writing songs really as, as a vehicle for us to jam. I've been lucky enough to work with um, a, a lot of great um, writers, you know, Jim Capaldi and uh, um, Will Jennings. But I like to keep a routine when I'm writing. And I've also started a new collaboration with a man by the name of Peter Godwin, who's a great writer. <laughs> The 
most of the songs, I think, on the album, if I remember rightly, started with a musical idea and then the lyrics grew out of the music. But I think with Drowning, it started with a, a lyric, a lyric idea, and then the music grew out of, out of the lyric. And it was interesting because uh, Peter Godwin said that he envisaged it as Robert Johnson in Chelsea, you know, in 2007 or something. So we both felt that that was a good description of the song. Keep driving, don't matter if the highway's lost. Keep running, never turn your head. The album starts with drowning, and uh, I think it particularly does hark back a little way to my own beginnings, which were um, with the Spencer Davis Group and before the Spencer Davis Group, where, where I was, you know, listening to a lot of blues, folk blues, country blues, urban blues, and um, this was obviously a big influence um, on me, and, and I've tried to keep that uh, um, influence uh, or elements of that influence all, all the way through the music, even though I've you know, gone on to try and combine elements of Latin and Brazilian music as well, which aren't necessarily the best, you know, bedfellows, you know, blues and Brazilian or, you know, uh, but I've, I've always endeavored to try and mix these elements to try and make a, some kind of soup out of it. Got everything. Computer, phone, keys. Right, come on, dogs. Um, I've been here 40 years, and uh, the place has changed a bit. It's one of those things where. You sometimes think that you've you've made a bad deal uh, at the time, and then as the years go on, you realise you made a good one. A lot of this ground around here is what they call permanent pasture, so it's it's been grass for a, a, a long time, you know, hundreds of years, because this was originally sheep country. Of course, now the wall has gone right down in, in price again and doesn't even cover the cost of the man to actually cut the, cut the wool off. So obviously there's other things have to happen to the land. And then most of that now is, um, is conservation work and it's encouraging wildlife and uh, insect life, habitat for different animals and insects and birds and things, and that's what I, I try and do. That's the studio, that's work over there. That building there is where I uh, walk to most day and do a bit of playing up there. That's where we'll be playing today. We may have to go in the bottom there, it may be a bit muddy. So I hope you've got your boots on. Let's go. Well, there are lots of these barns around this area and they really from pre-industrial farming and since then the introduction of farm machinery and everything, they're fairly redundant and a lot of these buildings still exist and they're just being used to park some old tractor in or something. It's quite big, it's quite live, and it just gets a bit windy outside, you might hear that, but um, it has a character um, which obviously gets in some way down the microphone um, onto, the, uh, onto the record. The 
thing that always interests me is bringing different cultures and different music cultures together and for me that is the most exciting thing ever and I think that Fly we've managed to bring Brazilian, uh, South African, Celtic uh, elements together which was played and recorded in the middle highlands of England so that also reflects I think on on what everyone does and the way everyone plays but uh, uh, it's um, a song that's, that I think is central to the to the whole album. Fly is the uh, first track on the album that has uh, Paul Booth, saxophone player and flautist and, uh, and he plays whistle on, on this song and I think it's an inspired performance by him. I do consciously try and mix elements. It's a bit like, you know, celebrity chef, you know, try and add unusual flavors that people don't expect. But it is something that I've always consciously tried to do right from early traffic days. We used elements of African music, English folk music, rock, jazz. And these are all things that I still consciously try and balance out, particularly throughout an album, so that, for instance, if I feel an album is going too world music or too rock, then I try and balance that out with something that has a bit of jazz or a bit of folk in it, just to try and balance it out, because to me, they're all flavors that, taken all together, uh, create the whole dish. There is a saying that that musicians are different to music lovers and that musicians aren't necessarily music lovers. And I subscribe to that um, in as much as I don't always listen to music for fun. I'm listening to music to try and get something from it as well, which I think a lot of musicians listen to music because they feel that that's getting close to what they're doing and then they want to see how they can fine tune their music by what other people are doing. And that was, uh, that was um, African musician Anthony Kwakuba, Rebop Kwakuba, who told me that uh, 
uh, you know, years and years ago, I said there's two different things, musicians and music lovers, and they're not the same thing. The guitar on Hungry Man is played by uh, um, Tim Cansfield, who's, who's a guitarist that, that I've worked with in the past, and Joe Sayer plays as well on the song. But actually, the, the lick itself was something that I copped off Joe Zare because he, Joe Zare worked a lot in, in South Africa with Ayato and did a lot of, um, learned a lot of township style guitar playing. And this was some particular thing that I'm not even sure he remembered playing some time ago, but we, we would record everything when we were playing live uh, at Soundcheck. I played it back to him probably about two years later, and I don't think he knew. He had to relearn it. He didn't know how, what it was. I said, no, well, that's, that's you. So I think this is a bit of wheat here, and then behind you is some maize which we plant for habitat. And when that goes down, a lot of, on the ground like that, it's got a lot of sugars in it and a lot of wild animals, birds, insects like to eat all that stuff. So. There's a kind of crop in front of there, that stuff which has gone all, which is oilseed rape. And you get a lot of these little songbirds, you probably see them, and that's why the kestrels hover around there, because they're trying to catch songbirds. And I know in America they have a different thing, but in England you see these yellow fields in the, uh, in the spring. That's oilseed rape, and then uh, they get an oil from the rape and use it for cooking. And then after it's been used for cooking, it gets filtered again, and you can put it in your car, which I put in my old van, and it smells like a fish and chip shop when you start it up in the morning. What's it? What's it? Come on. What's it? Come on. What's that? What's that? Go on. What's over there? I've started recently, uh, uh, I say recently, over the last, you know, five or ten years, to, to get really into the Hammond organ. Just about Ten or so years ago, I went and saw a couple of organists play, and, and for years I'd been trying to figure out how these organists play the bass, and by actually watching and listening that I eventually figured out what was going on, and then, I, then I tr I've been trying to apply that to, to music, because, of course, that is a thing that's particularly American style of, of playing. Lawrence Hammond was actually, he was a clockmaker and he tried to build a, a church organ that didn't take the maintenance and was uh, emulate a church organ. And of course, he didn't actually do that. He missed the mark by, by quite a way. And then the organ itself was taken up by the black churches and the particular style was developed of playing the Hammond organ. So the organ has been very, uh, very, very, recent, in, in the last 10 years, um, a part of what I'm doing. Um, it really, in as much as the last album, uh, About Time, I, I didn't play any guitar on it. I think it's the first album I never played any guitar on. Um, Nine Lives is different in as much as I've used, I play guitar, but um, I've still kept that the organ bass and all the bass on Nine Lives is played on the organ. And I've still tried to keep that thing going.
city. It's very much a rock song. And on the album has Eric Clapton playing fantastic guitar on it. In the early days of the 60s, Eric and I first met and Eric uh, took me under his wing and, uh, and introduced me to some of his friends and we used to listen to music and share music and discuss and play a bit and, and uh, although we were both playing with different bands, he was playing with John Mayall at the time and I was, uh, uh, I was with Spencer Tate's group, I would think. And so we both went our ways then. And I think Eric and I always had it in, in our minds. Uh, I, for my part, had that it would always be great. I'd always love to play with Eric. And, uh, and it was only then when Cream broke up, we decided that we would get together and form Blind Faith. Good, sounded good, Steve. Yeah. Right. A bit of, bit of tune, but good. Sandwich. 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 Well, Eric and I played together last year. We, we did a benefit for something called Countryside Alliance, which is to support a lot of rural issues, something very important to me. And it was, was as I say, after a long time of us, Eric and I, not playing together, he invited me very kindly to play with him on, on the Crossroads concert. And that, again, seemed to go very well, very, very successful. We, we only ever took one step at a time, and we wanted to make sure that what we did, we both enjoyed, and, and we did. And so we've taken it the next step now, and we've gone for these three shows at Madison Square Gardens. We'll, uh, we'll see how it goes, but I'm very excited about it, and uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to immensely to playing with with Eric. Come down.
Blind Faith was uh, very short-lived and we were not exactly cornered, but, but we, it was great pressure on us to do it and get it organised and let's get out there and, and play it. And the playing was a lot more pressure than the recording. And I think the recording, we, we took the time and the opportunity and the chance to, to try things out and to experiment a little and to put our ideas across in a very controlled atmosphere. I think the album, because it was possibly a little more studied on how we would do it, I think it's, it stands up very well. For that reason, I think there, is, there has been a lot of interest in not um, reliving the band, and in fact this concert we're doing is not a Blind Faith reunion. But obviously we will touch on some of those songs, and I think that contributes to a lot of the interest in these shows. Yes, I'm 60 this year. I'd like to think it brings a bit of, you know, wisdom and a bit of knowledge to what I do. I'm not sure whether it does. That's for other people to decide. I don't agree necessarily that the great music all took place in the 60s and and 70s, uh, and that there's, there's no music to fill its place. Now, I, I don't think that's quite right. I mean, I, for my part, I'm trying to do what I've always done, which is trying to, you know, endeavouring to still try and make classic records, whether they are or not, only time will tell. But in, in so doing, I don't forsake any of the music that I've done in the past. I think there were great things that Blind Faith did. And, uh, and Traffic has, has its place in history and, and, and they're great songs to play and I enjoy playing them. Yeah, I go, right, I'm gonna sit down now and write a classic song because uh, it's one of those things that I always would love to do, but unfortunately it's not, uh, it's not one of those, or, or let's say a classic album, I'd love to say, right, phone a few people, say, right, lads, next week we're gonna make a classic album. We've been, messing around making all these ones that... But of course, it's not something you really necessarily have any control over and often don't really know at the time that it's happened. In the meantime, I've got Nine Lives coming out and, and I'm, I'm very excited about that, about playing that stuff live because it very much lends itself to being played live and... Um, and I'm looking forward to very much playing, uh, doing a tour. The Shore is definitely part of the core concept of the album. It's, it's the band all, all playing together. We think that we've just made something that's greater than the sum of the parts. And of course, that's always something that you're trying to do with, with any uh, song. Um, you, you take some lyrics and you take some music which you feel the lyrics are great, you feel the music's great, but hopefully when you put the two things together, you get something, you get yet another life out of those two things. And we feel that that, that uh, at the shore got uh, an identity and a, and a life of its own. We in, instinctively all felt that we got something that was very special.
Okay, see you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care. Better watch out for the fumes. Chip flat. Right.